Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. I am your host, Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, I talk to illustrator and animator Francesca Gambatesa. Francesca is a paisan, and she hails from the same region of Italy, Puglia, as my parents. Among other topics, we talk about why Puglia is Italy's best kept secret. Francesca explains why her influences are, quote, eclectic. She shares tips on how to find an illustration agent. And she tells us what she thinks about when she thinks about character design. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Ciao Francesca, come stai? Oh wow, ciao Giuseppe. Uh, sto bene, sto molto bene. È molto bello sentirti. È ah, bello te. sentirti parlare in italiano. Eh, sto, pra- sto praticando. Uh, ho bisogno di... Molto bene. Non, io non ho, ho ogni giorno non ho l'opportunità di parlare italiano. Eh, è, no. è, pro- oh. è proprio difficile per me perché penso in inglese. E dopo sì. devo uh, traduire in italiano. Certo, certo. È, è difficile per me. Eh sì che è difficile, è difficile. È... è difficile specialmente perché non puoi parlare tutti i giorni. Sì, eh. vero. <ride> Devi trovare un uh, a friend, un amico con cui parlare. <ride> Forse noi due uh, possiamo, possiamo fare un, un podcast ogni mese, una volta ogni mese. Uh, sì. Parliamo in italiano. In italiano. Su, su podcast, sì. Dai, va bene, okay. privato. Ok, okay. okay. e io, io sto uh, molto felice che tu stai mm. qui con me. Mm-hmm. E parliamo un po' di, di te, e il tuo lavoro e sì. tante altre cose. Va bene? Benissimo, benissimo. Sì, certo. In, in inglese, per favore. <laughs> oh, ok. Ok. <laughs> That's fine. Hi, Francesca. Hi, Giuseppe. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. I try. I try. Poor, well done. Poorly. It's good not to lose your connection with yeah. your roots. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to another illustrator who's Italian um, ah. and uh-huh. uh, a little bit ago, and We, we talked, we spoke in Italian a little bit. It's so difficult. It is such a difficult thing for me to, to, to sort of get through the um, embarrassment of it. The embarrassment of not being fully fluent. Having a name yeah. like Giuseppe, you'd think, yeah. you know. But, uh, you know, I, I'm trying. Yeah. No, no, but I mean, you know, the, the good thing is to just have a bit have a bit of, you know, of language exactly. and then you can just practice whenever you can. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I was saying it would be great if you and I did like a, a monthly, you know, speaking Italian with Francesca uh, episodes. <laughs> yeah. That would be, that would be a lot of fun. Le- yeah, learn five words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, the first episode just to get people's in- attention and interest would be uh, five cuss words that you could say. <laughs> particularly when yeah. your computer crashes or when you yeah. spill watercolor on your paper exactly exactly yeah. <laughs> should hear me yeah. yeah i won't say that uh, my mother was uh, and still is a uh, renaissance master when it comes to uh, italian cuss words when i was growing up it was uh, just a just gorgeous poetry in 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 vulgar form it was, it was a beautiful thing to see i know, I know. This is typical of people that sometimes talk to talk with their language, uh, sorry, with their dialects, mm-hmm. obviously. So it's like um, even growing up and speaking Italian in Italy, you would have maybe heard some very weird um, words because your parents speak in, you know, sometimes they did turn and speak in um, dialect, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you and I are yeah. quite legitimately paisan. Because well, yeah. my parents mm. are from Puglia. Exactly. And my parents are also from Puglia. So, yeah. Where exactly were your parents from? Or are your parents from? 
Um, my parents are um, from towns around villages and towns around Bari, which is the main um, main city in the region. Right, and the University of Bari is there. And, yeah, exactly. Um, it's a it's port really town. Big. It is, yeah, and people it's... who travel to Greece from Italy typically go through, go through Bari. Bari. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Indeed. What, what towns? What towns exactly? Were they, were they uh, so my dad is Noicattaro and my mom is Gioia del Colle. But my uh, partner, I must point out that he's, my partner is um, family is originally from Casa Massima. So, um, which I hear it's your original. Um, yes, um, I did not know that. Oh my goodness. Know? No, I did not know. Oh. I didn't know your partner's uh, from Casa Massima. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, yeah, my. So, yeah, I bet your listeners would be very intrigued by all of this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you, cousin. I am. I mean, my cousin Asina <laughs> is what, like, you know, yeah. five thousand people strong yeah, or exactly. something. Village, isn't it? He's like, uh, yeah, yeah. And my parents. Yeah, I noticed obviously that you, um, your family is originally from Cousin Asina, yeah. being the same town as my. That's right. Uh, pan family. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, my my. If, I mean, there's. I still have a lot of family there, and um, my dad grew up on a farm right outside of the town limits, and mm. um, it on Via San Michele. I don't know if you've, you're familiar with the road there, but that's you, if you go to if you stay in the like the Centro area, the, the yeah. Centro Storico area, and then yeah. the Via San Michele sort of goes directly out of that. And if you just follow that road for you walk for about twelve yeah. minutes, yeah, uh, there's my father's farm. Oh, that's interesting. That is, that's <laughs> fascinating. Fascinating indeed. <laughs> uh, do you speak the Pugliese dialect at all? No, no. And um, no. But, uh, <laughs> it's like, no, I'm saying it that way because actually um, dialect, dialect in Bari is um, almost seen as a, as, a, as a language in itself. That's it's right. Got so many, um, in fact, so many words are totally different from the Italian language that mm -hmm. you, you don't have a clue, basically, if you're not from there. Yeah. Mm. Here's a quick example. Andiamo means let's yeah. go. And yeah. uh, dialect is shamanin. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole lot. I mean, there's, it's such a completely different language. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. It is, but also, you know, it's like it's got so much influence from the um, centuries where foreigners were um, were there. So, right. like Spanish or French, mm -hmm. you know, all sorts. They yeah, all left a... a mark into the language and into the region as well. I mean, architecturally, yeah. Uh, yeah. you'll see these like Albero Bello has these truly um, yeah. that it's sort of inexplicable how they. <laughs> how they got there it's 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 like very specific kind of conical hut and um out of out of the stone yeah. that they you know dug yeah. up there yeah and it's, it's super it's, it's, yeah it's very intriguing odd. yeah yeah is is in fact it's it's more and more popular um among tourists and foreigners because right. they're so attracted by this kind of um very unusual um architecture that's yeah. right and lecce mm -hmm. is um mm -hmm. the second biggest town i would say um yeah. a couple hours south of Bari, and and it's yeah. the baroque or one of the baroque indeed. capitals of the world yeah indeed and it's so interesting how different it is from Bari, for instance i mean there's same region but this totally different architecture feel uh the stone has got a different color so it's quite interesting yeah. and varied yeah i read recently and by recently i mean over the past maybe six months uh that mm. puglia finally overtook tuscany in terms of number of visitors <laughs> number of tourists Amazing! No, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, didn't know. But I know. I mean, living in London, um, I can tell you that, especially um, UK um, tourists um, are re extremely drawn to Puglia, and so I know so many uh, British friends who mm -hmm. travel there for holidays, and a lots of people actually have got properties there as well. So it's really interesting how mm -hmm. they are very keen on that kind of landscape and you know it's nice for sure so you are in london how did you yeah. so let's like 
get let's just like connect the dots and mm. and <laughs> figure out how someone from Puglia uh, made their way mm. to London and is now uh, I would say prolific children's book illustrator animator I mean you do so many different sort of different kinds of things and so I want to get to that point I want to get to like how you got there so did you when did you realize like art art actually might be uh, a viable choice for you uh, it was quite natural for me I mean if we go back um, to my childhood um, it was just very natural for me to to, to be comfortable uh, uh, making art drawing let's say drawing I felt comfortable and um, and I was praised to, to, to by adults and that made me realize that maybe I could be good doing that and I think it's just very automatic if you are a child and you get praise for something you do you just attach some value to that so it was really um, a simple thing in a way like I I would draw and uh, I would feel comfortable and I went on doing that and I was uh, lucky enough to have a family that was not against it I went on to study art high school um i was I, I grew up in rome because my dad was working there so um i was in a big city studying art in a high, in high school and then i just it was very natural for me it wasn't like i didn't it was lucky in a sense that i didn't have to push against something you know um uh, so and then i went on to study um art at college and eventually animation in fact mm-hmm. um at a film school in rome well what school did you go to in rome i went to the academia di belle arti in rome and i've studied set design there but then i went on to study further and i did a so kind of um let's say a mass i would say master but, um it wasn't called master at the time um it's a, a specific a course at the Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia, which is a, a national film school in Italy, uh, where I studied animation. At the time, what was the end goal for you? Did, did you have an idea as to what you were going to do professionally? I must say I was not very clear, and that was my unfortunately weak kind of <laughs> point, in a sense, because I was so interested in many different things that um, uh, I was not sure. Um, in fact, I tried, let's, I tried stop motion animation and I've done a film all by, you know, drawn on paper. So I've done different kinds of experiments and films. And when I got out of that course, um, I was still confused, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but, um, but then I found a job into a stop motion um, studio. Um, which is very unusual for Italian, um, in you know, animation industry, which is uh, virtually non-existent in a way. Uh, but yeah, there was this uh, stop motion um, studio where I worked for a couple of days with other mates, mm-hmm. let's say, <laughs> from the film school. And um, it was a really, really good period because we were like out of college, finally you know, being independent, renting our own house mm-hmm. and and just working in an animation studio, mm-hmm. basically. Was that was that mm. still in Rome? No, that was in Umbria, uh, just a region not far from from Lazio, where Rome yeah. is. And um, yeah, an unusual place for a studio. Very nice and, and you know, very wonderful surroundings. Yeah, Umbria, but, yeah. Umbria is a little bit of a lesser known, but still very gorgeous yeah. region of Italy. Very. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. I believe mm. that's where the color umber comes from. The, the, the ground. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I, actually. I could be wrong. I could <laughs> be wrong, but I remember years ago <laughs> I was sure. traveling around Italy uh, with school and we were, we were mm-hmm. visiting the region of Umbria and um, uh, a professor or someone said something to the effect that, that the re- the origin of the color umber and burnt umber comes from comes from Umbria. Oh, fantastic! I didn't know, but obviously uh, Terra di Siena, no, right. is a is a color, uh, and it's like it's, it's literally uh, the earth of of Siena. Mm-hmm. 
right? So terra di siena is actually a color in our, um, you know, palette. Sure. What was your first experience with children's books? It came much later. In fact, um, I've always been interested in in designing my own characters and designing my, you know, uh, like, let's say, um, something that then I would animate. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was quite, quite uh, one thing, in a way, designing and then animating. And so I'd done that, except for projects where I had just to animate things that someone else designed. But the designing was always part of of my thing, let's say. So thinking about children's books, um, for me, was like... Uh, in a way, a dream kind of thing. I didn't, I didn't know if I was ever going to be um, able to do it, but but it was in a way in my head a dream, something that I would would have loved to do because because of that thing and because I love to to design things and to and to create characters, and this happened much later when I actually um, came to live in London. And I think London, uh, the very first years, I mean, London since 2008, and so it's 11 years. And I think the first, uh, the first few years were at the same time difficult, because I had changed the land, my landscape in terms of work, um, connections and all of that, but um, it was really at the same time very good because it gave me the opportunity to to share studio, let's mm-hmm. say, with some creatives that were already doing illustration. Mm-hmm. There were animators and there were also illustrators. Um, so I worked with someone on an animation project and at the same time I was sharing a studio with other creatives and I saw them working on their illustrations and that was very inspiring for me. And I think I think for anyone that is creative and needs a bit of a push Mm -hmm. because let's say I'm not the most kind of um, uh, how do you say um, self-assertive creative that you can meet yeah me neither um, I'm I'm in your boat I think it's so important to actually see someone else doing their own thing and you just just get along you just kind of get the vibe and and you just think oh well you know it's not that in thing where you don't see people doing stuff where you don't even know how they do it actually really is a helpful mm-hmm. and um i realized then um that it was feasible doable and we would share advice a bit and um and um i just i just got together a small portfolio a few bits and pieces of things that i designed and characters and i looked for an agent and that was the the very important part of of you know me then pushing and um uh for instance i went to a children's book fair which is something that i would definitely recommend to someone beginning with their career as an illustrator so a children's book fair where where you can meet some people from the industry that can look at your portfolio and can give you advice um it's so valuable um, it's re- it really is valuable. Also, there's people that can, if, if, if you've got strong enough pieces in your portfolio, can remind you for some jobs, let's mm-hmm. say. And this is sub- something that happened when I went to Bologna, which is a very big and actually probably the biggest in Europe children's book fair in Bologna, Italy, again, um, uh, where there's um, an incredible display of publishers and uh, what they, you know, what they've done throughout the year. You can see all the publications out there and it's um, industry only. Um, It's 
it's like focused on the on people making books right. and so it's great that if you can go there definitely go there or in the states i'm sure there's something similar and um and i i had the chance to meet an art director uh, from osborne uh, which is a uk publisher uh, and um, she liked some of the pieces in my portfolio and I got to do that my first um, my first serious book let's say with them published in the UK mm-hmm. just a sticker book but it's like you know it's um, it's been out there for years it's been you know now there's like quite a few um, uh, how do you say coalitions right. Um, in different languages so very interesting sure and yeah. it's you know just a sticker book it's it's it isn't just oh, yeah. it's a sticker book i mean it is a book and i think yeah. that yeah that's a yeah point i want to make about that is uh mm. with a lot of the conversations that i'm having with illustrators through the school the focus tends to be the default focus tends to be that you know jacketed hardcover 40 page picture book or bust or nothing and Mm -hmm. there are so many other kinds of formats so many other ways of putting your work out there board books sticker books i mean it's on and on absolutely absolutely so it's it's it's, school books exactly Mm -hmm. oh right exactly you know textbooks um so it's you know it's it's always it's a good idea obviously to be as creative with how you see your work out in the world as it is um, with what it is that you're creating, you know, or what it is that you're making. Um, I just feel like sometimes it's people think of wanting to be wanting to get into the children's book world and only focusing solely on that format without, you know, sort of putting blinders on with as far as, far as other opportunities are concerned. It's very good to be to be aware of the many different mm-hmm. formats that you can uh, provide illustrations for. It's really, really valuable. You know, it's like for me when I say only a sticker book, what I mean is, I mean it, it's it's been really hard work. I think there's 150 uh, you know spot illustrations in that book. It's just that what I say, what I wanted to say is more like. Um, it's, it's like when you do a picture book, I suppose, and there's a narrative that includes um, uh, another kind of work. It's like it's expected that you do. Uh, it's, it's a very emotional kind of thing that you have to express, as well as you have to be good at drawing and good with color and characters. Uh, and that's all fine. But let's say... That's what I mean when I say, you know, give me any day, <laughs> um, you know, like t- I love textbooks. I've done quite a few. I love making them. For me, it's like it's work. It's hard work, but it's also relaxing in a way. It's like picture books for me are quite demanding, <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, indeed demanding if you ask yeah, me. <laughs> for sure. So during your search for an agent, um, What was that experience Hmm. like? Were you successful right off the bat or did you experience a number of rejections? How did that go? I must say um, I was very insecure about it. But but then just I remember uh, someone in the studio just saying, get on with it, you know. (laughs) It's like I needed, I really needed a push. It's just, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe other people have it. When they, when you look at your work and you go like, oh, there's just like eight pieces that are okay. And then there's other three pieces that I'm mm, not sure about that. I mean, and someone says to you, well, you know, you really get on with it. So it's like, okay, right. You don't want to postpone anymore. It's like you want to have some form of, um, some form of feedback and so I set out to to contact a few illustration agencies I think I sent out my little pdf um, to maybe six or seven just just as a taster to see how it went Um, one was interested but then didn't go through and then two, I was lucky enough one a very small literary agency and the other was a a big, bigish kind of uh, illustrators agency. They both uh, said that they were interested in representing me. So what I'd done was actually saying to myself, these two uh, 
are interested. So I'm going to meet with them personally. So I definitely would suggest to do this. You meet with the with the people that are, that are saying that are interested in your work, and you see what the vibes are. Mm-hmm. I think it's very important to see to see the person face to face, to see the people that want to represent you face to face, and um, and to just get um, get an impression and get and get to hear what they what they what they say about your work. And then I decided for the small literary agency. Uh, which turned out uh, a very nice choice. Why did you go? Why did you go small? Because I was not impressed. As I say, it was really good to meet face to face because the agents, the bigger agency with lots and lots of illustrators, I knew that they were having, they were making lots of you know business with um, publishing houses and stuff, but. I was not um, I was not impressed with face to face meeting because they almost didn't remember who I was, oh. and that that was I mean obviously um, obviously they said they liked my work and I do believe that, but when that when I met them um, the person was actually struggling to remember and just they had like oh yeah yeah all right so it's like you know when is something like that you think like oh, how am I gonna yep. How how are they gonna you know be like a champion yep. your work if they are from the start a bit like like that? Right. You and know? you just have to trust your instinct. I mean that's that's that sounds to yeah. me like it was pretty clear cut. Well, you know, meeting them face to face made the difference. That's, right. that's a great piece of advice. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's smart. Very very smart. If yeah. you can, I mean, obviously, if your agent is across the, the other yes, side of the planet, of then it's a little bit difficult. But you could still. Um, chat with them via the web yeah easily enough. exactly in fact yeah. that's yeah preferable i mean if, if illustrators listening to this find themselves in the fortunate position of having two even one agent um interested in them mm-hmm. uh yeah. that would be the next thing i would say is is say great but can we not but but great can we talk person to person either physically or virtually do you remember what you asked them? Were there any questions that you needed them to answer for you? Uh, I remember at the time I did a bit of homework on the, on the internet, I must say, and that helped. Um, so I had a little list of questions that I now I can't recall <laughs> anymore. Uh, unfortunately, right. sorry. But I would definitely advise, um, uh, you know, um, people that want to start out just to check. Uh, there's lots of advice on 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 sensible questions that you can ask to your uh, perspective yeah. agent. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. off the top of my head, I would want to ask mm. something like, um, "What is their uh, process as far as you know staying connected with potential clients? Like, what is their marketing strategy for their their artists?" Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, what is their yeah. vision for you? What do how do they envision working with you what areas um, do they think your work could apply to fit in. Could fit yeah. in, right if it's not working out and i think this is a perfectly okay thing to ask if if after x number of months if it's not working out mm. Uh, mm-hmm. can i terminate the contract can i terminate the relationship yeah. amicably yeah. you know can yeah. can this so yeah. can we separate what does that look like yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I mean, in my experience, which is not, you know, huge, but I can tell you that um, agencies are very, I mean, at least literary agencies are, I mean, there's not a fixed term to your contract. If things don't work out and you feel that they're not working out, it just you know, there's a there's a there's a way to say things, and and I'm sure that they will agree with you, or even if they don't agree with you, then there is a there's a notice that you can give to your agency, and um, you probably just have to wait for three months or two months, whatever it is, the time that they set on the contract, to to terminate your agreement. Right. So you know, it's not it's, it's not big no. it's not big deal. You said that mm. getting into children's books was a dream. Did, were you when you were younger? Mm. Um, did you were you reading children's books? Like who were you reading? What types of books really piqued your interest? Which illustrators piqued your interest? I'm not 
not someone that collects stuff. It's like I'm taken by so many different things. I would go to libraries and like I would love to look at, for instance, Barba Papa, you know, the, the I don't know if you know these characters. I don't know if they're called that way, but they're French family of um, shape changers. They have like the dad is pink and the mom is black. And it's like it's a series of books for children, young children. And something like that is so wonderfully imaginative mm-hmm. that, that I love it. It's like, you know, I just would love um, when I was, I must say, when I was small, I didn't have many picture books um, in my house. Uh, but but then, yeah. Growing up, I, I, oh, growing up, I was hooked to Japanese um, uh, Japanese uh, animation, and and that is also another influence. It's funny. It's like I can say I've got an eclectic <laughs> a catalog of, of of reference in my mind and my and my soul. Let's say so. And then obviously, there's lots of loves uh, from when I was you know more grown up. People like Quentin Blake, I find um, amazing. It's like to say a classic, a super classic. Um, Ronald Searle, obviously. Mm -hmm. I've got this wonderful Il Giornalino di Giamburrasca, which is a wonderful, um, uh, wonderful Italian classic by Vamba. And um, you can't, you can't recall it probably but this is has got such fantastic illustrations in it and it's a chapter book so um, uh it's really good fun then i've got a chapter book uh, illustrated by mark butavan and then i've got a vintage book from fiep westendorp Mm -hmm. um i don't know if you know her but she's uh, from the netherlands and um it's a wonderful uh, 60s style, obviously, from the 60s. Mm-hmm. And um, these illustrations are so, so cute. <laughs> it's incredible. And I'm going to put some of these names in the um, show notes of the episode, because just for other folks to take a look at in case they're not unaware of these illustrators. Um, oh, interestingly, oh. so yeah, your, your interests are certainly eclectic. To look at your website, you have a number of different directions that you create work, Uh, picture books, Mm -hmm. character design, chapter books, learning books, activity sheets, animation, the underpainting to everything that you do, regardless of what it is, is, is your sort of command of character design. And character design is something that is certainly a very large hurdle for a lot of illustrators. It's, you know, it's, in some cases, it's like, well, what, what is character design? You know, how do I even approach character design? Is it just a matter of making the kids cute, you know, and, or something a little bit more on the superficial level? But as far as character design goes, how I see it anyway, it's really a, 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 a an interpretation of shapes, just simple shapes. You start there and you build out from there. Regardless of what the character is, if it's a person, a tiger, a paperclip, it doesn't matter. It it's really starts with like really strong shape language, and then you build up from that. That to me is a, is a successful way of designing a character. So that's why I wanted to have you on the podcast for a lot of reasons. One, to speak Italian to you and to say hello, but also, <laughs> but also to really talk about character design. When you're sitting down and you're thinking about a character, take us through your process of character design. For me, because I have not been trained formally as a character designer or as an illustrator, I don't know if there's illustration courses where you probably have um, character design as one of the subject matters. For me, it's very uh, instinct, instinct. Mm-hmm. According to what it is, what are the personality traits of that character, then I start to build shapes and expressions. And expressions, let's say facial expressions, are so essential to then also defining what the shape of the of the body is so it's a, it goes together but really I, I probably if I look at my 
design sheets and and the first doodles that I do, they often come with the expression of the face. And that is the first thing that comes to mind if you've got a character, if you're thinking about personality of someone, what do you do? You, you just draw their eyes, probably. You, do, you draw an expression that captures that kind of the essence of that character. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, um, and you go on. It sounds as if, like, while you're doing this from beginning to end, you're just continually asking yourself questions. Yes, and, and, quite a lot. Right. And that's, I think, that might be one of the keys, if not the key when you're sitting down Mm. and you're about to start a character design for whatever reason, yeah. Mm. Ask yourself like, who is this person? What experiences have they had up until this point that I'm about to draw them? How do they think about the world? Yeah. What is their personality? You know, when I talk to illustrators about character design, I, I like to use Yuri Shulevitz and his book snow. Um, in that book, there are characters in, um, big and small, I mean, thin and thick, just all sorts, young and old. And what he was so good at doing was really giving you that character's life history just in the design, not only of their shape, not only of their expression, but also the choice in their wardrobe, the things they were holding and carrying. There's one piece in particular where there's a woman and a man sort of facing each other. And the man is incredibly tall. And the woman is short. The man, everything he owns, everything on his person is tall or long. His hat is tall. His mustache is really long. His, you know, which leads you to believe that if you visited his home, everything in his home would be tall or long. And the woman is the opposite. So she's short and she's holding a purse that would never carry, couldn't possibly carry a single key, let alone a number of keys or a wallet or anything. And she's holding an umbrella Mm -hmm. that's so small that it wouldn't block a handful of raindrops, let alone the rain. So she's holding Mm -hmm. things that are pretty to look at, but aren't very useful. So then that leads you to Mm -hmm. believe that maybe if you visited her home, it would be a whole lot of prettiness without a whole, without much of um, practicality. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, and they're just yeah. so beautifully designed, uh, both of them. And it's it's just looking at them, not knowing anything about them, not even reading the book or anything. It allows the viewer to Im- imagine what that character thinks and who they are. And I think that is really mm-hmm. the the sort of essence of good character design. So important to be aware of what you know the sh- how shape affects um, the viewer. Um, so this thing of having a character that's very tall and everything is long about it, um, it just, that really is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of represents or says, says a lot about good character design. I think being aware of how shapes, um, affect, uh, the viewer, it's very important. Basically. So, um, I, we've been talking a whole lot about, um, how fun it is to, draw characters and illustrate picture books and uh, mm-hmm. work in other other avenues. Um, but I'm guessing that it's not all fun in games sometimes. Are, what is What has been the one, assuming there's only one, but I'm sure there's more than one, but let's just stick with one. <laughs> what has been like the one biggest challenge for you since you decided um, to make make it a go as a as an artist? Let's talk specifically about children's books. It's an industry that it's it's a bit slow. Everything is a bit slow. So even if <laughs> even if um, you get you get signed up for a project, then it's great. But there might be delays, which is usual, and then you end up like working on something um, months and months later, let's say, and then you might be a bit late with your work, maybe you're, I don't know, struggling or something with something that you're supposed to be doing, and then all of that, I mean, the thing is, uh, it's it's not easy to keep it as a, as a cons- in terms of um, finance, uh, it's a bit difficult to be 
to be balanced with this job okay. because um, because it's it's not a regular income because there there are delays so all sorts of things that make this um, this job uh, a bit a bit kind of you know you you can't rely every month on something coming in. So you have to um, to put this into uh, into account, and 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 work um, and try to figure out how to make it work as best as you can. Basically, I think it's important to to, to be aware of this. How did you? Um, was this a realization that you had early on? Were you aware that it was going to be um, a sort of an ebb and flow sort of career, or what was what was your first experience? Uh, <laughs> As far as like realizing, like, oh my gosh, uh, I need to, I need to be a little bit better with my finances. I think it's like it, no, it's like I think some people um, have got have got a uh, have got a good understanding. They are better with finances. Um, I'm personally a bit rubbish. Uh, um, what you would say, a real like um, uh, head in the clouds type of person in a sense like I'm thinking all about what I'm doing deep into like work but then I'm not good on the you know business mm-hmm. side of things so um, that's why I think it's important to to be aware that you need to probably push for different kinds of things um, so you might end up having different projects on the go that's important mm-hmm. instead for me it's like for a period of like for a few years, I've had I've had lots of work on, and I, um, without having to ask for it in a sense, it just came to me, which was great. And then when I realized that work was drying out, um, I was not very good at being proactive to find work. So I think that is I don't know if other illustrators find the same difficulties but um it's always good to just prevent moments where you'll have less work let's say yeah and i think also Mm. just sticking with the children's book thing um that's why i think it's really important when you do get an offer and you do receive a contract Mm -hmm. that part of the payment structure is um, a signing payment of some sort you know payment right off the bat Uh, Mm because chances are you need the money and also it's a little bit of like it keeps the publisher honest a bit um, as opposed to having it because I've seen contracts over the years where um, there was no signing bonus there was no signing fee at all it was sign the contract and then do the (laughs) sketches and if we approve the sketches then you get your first half and if we approve the art then you get your second half Um, so you sort of started Mm -hmm. off your career with a focus on animation Lately, um, you've been doing quite a bit with animation, specifically with the film Billy by uh, Maki Yoshikura. Uh, Yes, well done. (laughs) Thanks for noticing. Well, I've I've been noticed. I follow you on Twitter, so I've I've seen that. Um, So Billy is is an animation that you've designed and art directed, and it was written and directed by uh, Yoshikura. Um, Yes. It's been selected in film festivals. I'm going to link to to it in the show notes because I think um, folks should mm-hmm. see the trailer. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so, how did that Thank come you. about? How did you get that opportunity? Well, um, it's it's important, and I think this is a is a I think this is important for whoever starts um, their creative journey. Let's say. To, to just hang out with other creatives, basically. <laughs> I think it's really important to, um, to, to, to just share some work experience, or even if it's not work experience, you might share, uh, you might share a space where other creatives um, are doing their things. And people see what you're doing, and you're seeing what other people's are, people are doing, and and this is a very important part of of, of your well-being as well. Let's put it sure. that way. It's like um, it's 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 a sharing experience on a human level as well as creative um, on a creative level. So, uh, for instance, I worked with Maki on my on one of my first animation jobs in London. Uh, in a studio called Voodoo Dog. 
it was a really nice little studio and I still see quite a lot of people from that studio. This means that when you get along well with people, then you just continue a relationship throughout years and then you end up doing something together eventually if you you know if you like each other's work and that's what happened with Maki because she's an amazing illustrator she's done some personal um, projects in the past and this one um, she had this story which I think is a really really beautiful touching story and she asked me if I would draw the characters and draw the film for her can you tell us a little bit about the story what's the what's Billy about yeah, Billy is the story of of a dog that um, lives with uh, with his with her. Sorry, Billy is actually a, a dog that actually exists. <laughs> so we based the character design on an actual dog that I met, and I took a few pictures of Billy. Um, so Billy is a dog that lives with her um, owner, who's um, who's an, uh, an an old man. They live happily together until until one day when her owner, unfortunately, doesn't wake up anymore. So the story follows Billy from the moment where uh, the owner dies and, yeah, throughout her little kind of adventures or misadventures. And um, it's very emotional with a very, very uplifting very uplifting happy ending and i'm not sure if i should reveal nope. it <laughs> nope. we, we are a so, spoiler uh spoiler free zone here yeah okay um so yeah are there plans on uh making a picture book out of this thing well i must say that i um i have in mind i, I would love to make a picture yeah. book and i've tried to yeah i've tried to um, to, do, to just put it down into a form, you know, like to see it down as a, as a picture yeah. book. And um, I hope to follow, to follow this up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like to, yeah. um, I like saying that illustration and animation are sort of twins. Um, one one mm. is just more energetic and active than the other. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, so this has been a lovely chat and I typically mm. like ending on a, sort of a helpful, tangible note of some kind. So remembering that you and I with us, and I, in my mind, you and I are sitting at a cafe having a, a cornetto and an, uh, an espresso <laughs> or cafe americano for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're sitting at this cafe and with us is uh, someone who is trying to get into some creative field, illustration, animation, whichever. What would be one tangible piece of advice that you would like to share? I can I can tell you that it's very important to follow your instinct and and produce work. Definitely be productive and do stuff. Don't be too afraid of the empty page, definitely. Um and, and do stuff because like more you do and more you see how you can improve things and that's so true coming from me I can tell you it's true (laughs) and um, uh, so definitely do stuff and even you know do it even if you feel oh that's finished do it again try again and see how it it improves you'll see it improves and then um, once you put together an amount of work that you're happy with, definitely seek someone that can give you, that is benevolent enough and has got some, you know, industry insights to give you advice. I think advice from someone that is a bit knowledgeable, it's very, very valuable. And, um, and um, you know, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, I mean, advice is fantastic, but also just stick to what you feel is right. Definitely, it's so important to, to, to not, you know, not to, to just just go all over the place with your with your work. It's you. It's, it's unique. So you have to kind of dig, dig until you find something that it 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 works. You know, it can work definitely, but you have to, to just uh, just just work on it long enough to make it very nice. Allora, Francesca. Yeah. 
Sì, Giuseppe. Grazie per uh, essere sul mio podcast. Um, oh, grazie a te, Giuseppe. Mi sono divertito Such molto. Such a pleasure. <ride> anche io, anche io. Spero di non aver detto troppe stupidaggini. Eh, in dialetto posso dire se ne masci, se manin. Se ne masci, non ne si mi Wow, that's very difficult. Well done. Thanks. Thanks, Francesca. Thanks for being on the podcast. Okay. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank ciao. you. Ciao, ciao, ciao. To learn more about Francesca, visit francescagam.co.uk. If you enjoyed our conversation, let us know by sharing it online, subscribing to the podcast, and providing a positive rating and review. Become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash illustration D-E-P-T. In return, you'll receive a gift, a discount code, and access to short episodes we're calling Extra Credit. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the alumni showcase, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.